Welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab and Co-Creation Studios public lecture series. I'm Kat Cizek and I'm the artistic director of the Co-Creation Studio. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white Gen X woman with brownish hair tied up back high in a ponytail and I'm wearing a big smile today. I'm in Tacaronto on the shores of Lake Cunny, Ontario, dish with one spoon territory. Today, it's really my pleasure to introduce our artist's talk with Joe Hunting, a filmmaker who has made the very first documentary film entirely in VR chat, a social VR online world. I first met Joe last summer through Venice Film Festival uh, through curator Liz Rosenthal when we were um, working on an immerse VR chat world hop party at the festival for our publication. And uh, Joe was kind enough to um, show us his world and document um, our party there. And that world hop was really, truly one of my highlights in the virtual world of 2021. Um, and it's really uh, no surprise uh, that uh, when Sundance uh, announced that they would premiere his feature film, we met in virtual reality. Uh, Joe uses cinematic virtual cameras to deliver a portrait of communities um, within VR chat. Uh, during the COVID lockdown crisis. Today, Joe joins us from London, UK, and he is currently touring that film all around the world. Um, his talk today is How We Met in Virtual Reality, Capturing Social VR on Film. And if I understand correctly, he's going to be taking us into that enchanting world at some point in his talk. So we're really, really thrilled to have you here, Joe. Over to you. Thank you so much. That was such a, a warm introduction and really brought back a lot of great memories um, that we shared when we first met Kat. So thank you so much to yourself and the whole MIT team as well for hosting me. It's a, it's a real privilege and honor to be speaking here today. Um, I'm gonna open with a presentation and I'm hoping that everyone can see that at the moment. Can I get a thumbs up that you can see my first slide? Just so I'm aware, or do I have to press a few keys in order to get that working? Joey, we need the share screen. Got it, okay, coming up. There we go, you should see my avatar, virtual me. Got it. Does everyone see that? Okay, perfect, yeah, thanks for your patience. Um, so I mean, I don't have to introduce myself too much more because Kat did such a wonderful job, but um, it's just an honor to be here. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Hunting and I'm a documentary filmmaker working inside of VR Chat, which is a social VR platform. And this here that you're seeing is my avatar and it's genuinely how most people know me uh, at this point. I've been shooting documentaries in VR Chat for three years now. And my most recent film is my first feature film called We Met in Virtual Reality, which as Kat mentioned, premiered at Sundance in January. And the documentary We Met in Virtual Reality is a 91 minute documentary filmed entirely inside of VR chat following two long distance couples who met through virtual reality and a sign language teacher in the deaf and hard of hearing VR community. The intention of the film is to really paint a broad portrait of what the experience of social VR is like from an emotional perspective during the pandemic through the eyes of these amazing people. I directed, shot, edited, and produced the film entirely independently. Over the year, I graduated out of film school, so I feel very lucky to have premiered at Sundance and also to have the opportunity to speak here. It wasn't, it wasn't too long ago that I was a student myself as well. In this talk, I'll be discussing what I learned about the documentary form through deconstructing not only We Met in Virtual Reality, but the short films that I made prior to coming into the feature film. Um, and through that, discussing how I approached shooting a feature documentary entirely inside of social VR. So I'll ramble on for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to get into VR and actually present a live demo of my camera and the production process that I would go through when doing an interview. Um, so please stay tuned for that uh, in about half an hour, unless you get bored of me talking, which I hope you don't. Um, so before I get into VR filmmaking and what my world is like, I just wanna briefly introduce my personal background and how I ended up getting into VR. I first got into documentary filmmaking as a teenager 
um, specifically in travel photography. My early influ influences with film was in experimental art film. And I studied art and film at college. And it was in college, I created a handful of very weird experimental documentary, ex experimental documentaries that I shot on my phone and on my DSLR camera. So my interest in documentary has always been very experimental and creating very scrappy handmade films. You can see me there in a few memories of me making my old films. Most of these films were edited video diaries from when I went traveling and they were just personal outlets for my own reflections after returning from those trips. This one is called Around Nepal. And I also created experimental films like this on trips to Norway, Canada, Spain, and even with home video footage from old family holidays. And I found a love for crafting really immersive handmade portraits of a place through film. Film was my way of really grounding myself in my memories and have always had a very nostalgic quality to, for me. I wanted to direct films with people in and bring life and narrative into these immersive worlds I was building. So I went to study film production at university in 2017. And it was in my second year that I fell into exploring stories in VR chat, inspired by this article that I read that came out uh, around that time. I see I'm buffering a little bit. So if I my voice starts to break, break down into the internet, then please do let me know. Um, this was the article that really brought my attention to VRChat. And in this article reads a handful of quotes from different VRChat users explaining how VR has saved their lives and profoundly affected the way that they form relationships and help them overcome issues with mental health. Um, and I, as a person who loved building immersive worlds in my films and was thirsty to tell stories about people and culture, VRChat literally, it's a place that was filled of thousands of different worlds and different cultures and different people. It just felt like a perfect place to go and explore that idea. I should also mention outside of my film background, I'm a huge gamer as well and grew up playing massively multiplayer games where I had a lot of online friends that I'd socialize with daily. So the stories I was interested in in VRChat about people finding friendships and relationships online uh, was something I felt personally connected to as well. I immediately started interviewing people about their social experiences inside VR chat. Um, at this time, I was just on my desktop PC, so I didn't have a headset. And to make that very clear, I was just screen recording on my PC, so I didn't have a headset. And all my expectations about social VR being a tangible, tangible place to be immersed in with various other people and it profoundly affecting our relationships, it was all happening and it was all true. Through exploring and interviewing various different people for about two months, I stumbled into a few stories which became my first short documentary, A Wider Screen. You know, the age group of people that have the most time on their hands and you know the most energy are young people and so they're going to take this medium and they're going to bring it up to mainstream what's that going to look like i don't know yo let's go to the japanese uh flower gardens and, and with the cherry blossoms bam you're there yo let's go play mini golf on the moon well bam you're there i created this short film whilst i was studying at film school and all of the theories and practices I was learning there, I directly applied to what I was making inside of VR chat. So this film was my first experiment in applying real film theory to a VR chat story with my own personal cinematic reflections. What you're seeing now is the, the trailer to the film, we can, which you can also find on YouTube if you search a wider screen, if you wanna watch it with sound. Um, and I was specifically really inspired by ideas around poetic and verite filmmaking at the time of making a wider screen and constructing a unique truth, which was very truthful, not only in real life, but also in the world of VR. And I'll speak more to that idea when we get to We Met in Virtual Reality. Um, and if you haven't seen a wider screen, it follows a few stories, but largely focuses on two Shiba dogs who fell for each other and were going through this intense romantic period inside a VR chat and they've never met in real life. One of my biggest reflections about 
the making of a wider screen was using the community made locations to help build character and narrative. And it's worth stating that if you don't know um, VR chat too well, everything from all of the worlds and all of the avatars, oh, they're all created by the users on the platform. And the scenes with the Shiba dogs largely all take place in this, this same beach hut world, which they actually showed me. It's called Silent Beach. And it's a really big world. And it has all of these nice spots to sit and mingle. There's a spot by the campfire, on beach lounges and in a bedroom. And it was kind of by accident, I realized that these different spots offered a really subtle narrative to their story. So we had our initial chat by the campfire and as the conversation progressed, we moved onto the beach lounges and then into the beach hut and finally onto the bed. So it felt like you spent an evening with these characters and it being the same world with the same lighting, colors and textures really helped give their story tone amongst the other scenes and the other subjects of the documentary. VR chat worlds obviously differ a lot more in aesthetic compared to a real life location. You can visit hyper-realistic worlds, low poly worlds or psychedelic worlds. So I think it's a really powerful tool to be aware of where you're positioning your subjects or your cast and how their avatars are relating to that space. It was through this film I realized environmental storytelling is equally as impactful, if not more than a live action project. After releasing a wider screen, I was enchanted by the world of VR chat and was desperate to experiment with shooting a dance led documentary about VR dances with full body tracking. And through socializing and going through going to various different dance events, I ended up meeting this fabulous community called Club Zodiac, who are a dance group inside VR chat that hosts spectacular dance shows with talented dancers all in full body tracking. I created this short film titled Club Zodiac, which is a portrait of this community through a collection of interviews and observational moments. And this was my first time really investigating a community and finding my own footsteps in how to approach shooting a whole community instead of just individual subjects. And I found just like with some other live action approaches to documentary, immersing myself in the community was the only way to fully understand the attitude of every person and the dance group specifically. So I went to all the dance shows, all the parties, the talk shows, podcasts, and through that discovered people who I felt had strong voices to represent the community. I really enjoyed this process of collaborating with the community to make a film and to work very closely with subjects. Through this film, I really found a love for capturing dance on film as well. There's really a magic that occurs when you see someone dancing in their embodied avatar and they're just purely expressing that version of themselves. And the reason I wanted to bring this film up is because it was surprisingly my most creatively challenging project. I was captivated by all of these talented people in the club and I shot a huge amount of coverage. However, I couldn't grasp the narrative of the film. And I went through this creative frustration questioning why I was making a wider screen so easy. That film basically found itself, but this one I just can't visualize. Even though the people and the stories were fascinating and they were all happening. When I made a wider screen, I was shooting my lived experience, playing and exploring the platform with not really any planning or consideration for what the cut of the film would be until I got into editing. When making Club Zodiac, I consciously tried to do the same thing, but ended up shifting the other way and forcing myself to understand what the edit would be whilst I was filming. And for me, that constant questioning of narrative and wanting very particular cuts unconsciously made me overthink it too much. I realized this whilst editing and to find the cut of Club Zodiac, I ended up just throwing footage together on the timeline, just guided by instinct and emotion. And now every time I get pent up questioning what I'm doing, I always remind myself to lean into play and have fun. I think filming, especially in VR, you have to embrace play and fun in your creativity because the medium you're in really encourages that. VR is naturally a playful medium. 
and also collaborate with your cast. Be inspired by the people in your story and collaborate with them. Making Club Zodiac more than anything solidified the stories that I was interested in telling and really making that film inspired me to go further. After finishing Club Zodiac, I immediately got my first personal VR headset. After creating two films about VR and researching about its potential, stepping inside it for the first time, everything just came flooded, flooding to a realization. And by fortunate timing, um, when I got my first VR headset, I was then commissioned by a streaming platform to shoot a documentary series entirely inside of VR chat. The show was called Virtually Speaking, um, and I worked on this film full time whilst in my final year of film school, which was very stressful and I don't recommend doing that. Um, but here you can see the poster. This was the first project I filmed entirely with myself in a VR headset as well, immersed with the, the subject of the documentary. And I was using the native VR chat camera, which you can see in these making of stills on the right hand side. Um, I was going through a bit of a dorky alien phase at this time, so please do not judge my appearance. Um, I'm over that hurdle now, I'm a pure human. Uh, it was just a phase, but anyway, this, this camera is actually an old camera now, um, and it was very simple and only had one focal length and no depth of field. So it was very simple. But even the experience of operating a camera in VR and standing present in the world with my collaborators was just everything I could have ever, ever dreamt of. Virtually speaking, really depended on having lots of varied locations to give each interview tone. So I spent up to two hours most days whilst in production, world hopping across the thousands of user created worlds to conduct test shoots ahead of every interview. And comparatively speaking to a physical production or even typical virtual production workflows where you're building assets from scratch, the ability to jump from five different locations in minutes was hugely freeing and fun. It was rare that there wasn't a VR chat world that um, suited the composition that I had in my head. Location scouting was also a very creative process that informed my writing as well for each of the documentary episodes. The production of Virtually Speaking was in 2020 from February to June. And obviously during that time, COVID hit and lockdown happened. And very quickly, VR became my second home, surrounded by friends that I'd made whilst filmmaking in places that I'd grown a lot of personal attachment to. And at this time, by very fortunate timing, a new camera came out created by a really talented community member called Hirabiki, which can simulate depth of field and gives you the ability to change focal lengths. It's a fully fledged cinema camera that can do all of the same functions as a real life camera. And this picture you're seeing here is the first time I got my hands on the camera. Here's a collection of photographs I took with VRC lens when I first, um, when I first got the camera myself. And as you can see, the ability to use specific lenses and simulate depth of field um, suddenly presented the world of VR chat in a much more cinematic way. And this new camera just caused a huge wave of inspiration and forced me to change my approach to filmmaking entirely. Um, there's a video here that sums up my camera very quickly, though I am going to do a camera demo after this talk. The experience of looking through my camera monitor, as you can see here, and capturing a moment in such a raw and natural way with the ability to shoot handheld and change lenses and, and fly it as a drone, it just brought me back to the joy of capturing a moment in the physical world with my very first travel films. And by this point, I had grown myself as a person through VR and had so much personal attachment that I needed to express. With this camera, the context of COVID and being immersed in various different communities, I was burning to make something longer that represented my own experience of VR chat observationally and authentically with the knowledge that I'd gained over my previous projects as I just discussed. 
and as well as telling stories that I felt audiences outside of VR could connect with, and that would bridge the gap between the two worlds of people who know VR and have used it and experienced it, and those who are learning about it for the first time. The approach to We Met in Virtual Reality was very patient and organic, capturing my lived experience of VR and editing very playfully as I traveled along. I took a very anthropological approach to, in studying established communities and then interviewing people who I felt had a strong voice in that different context. I revisited Club Zodiac to explore a story about sexuality and dance. I got involved in the Helping Hands Sign Language community to explore a story about teaching and mental health. I captured dance battles in the International Dance Association. I, I documented the community meetup, which is, a world, uh, which is for world creators to show their works in progress. I captured drunken nights on Poppy Street, which is a Japanese drinking district. And I had no idea what anyone was saying. Um, and I shot all of these observational moments with just a very distinct camera presence and focused on capturing and reacting to moments that I felt spoke a certain truth. My key inspirations for this kind of community-driven approach was in Bombay Beach by Alma Harrell, Hale County This Morning This Evening by Romel Ross, and Paris Is Burning by Jenny Livingston. All these films present narratives told by multiple protagonists to present an overall emotive impression on a place or a community. And I was doing the same thing, but in eight different communities all at the same time, because all I had to do was step through, step through a portal to go from one community to another. I found with this production compared to my previous ones, I was also drawing a lot more influence from physical films. Now I had access to this camera, which can present VR in a very similar way that these films are presented. And it was through this creative traveling process that I discovered the core stories that became the heart of We Met in Virtual Reality. Um, alongside balancing observational moments with loosely written interviews and carefully choreographed scenes that constructed a compelling narrative. Um, here are some photos of myself with the key subjects of We Met in Virtual Reality. Jenny, who is the sign language teacher in the Helping Hands community. Dust Bunny and Toaster, who are a long distance couple who use VR to grow their relationship during the pandemic, as did Dragonheart and Is Your Boy in the bottom right, and lastly, the Better Together VR crew, who are a friend group who came into VR during the pandemic and stream every week. Once I had an understanding of each of the subject's narratives, I wrote very loose scenes and plans to guide our conversations. And here you can see a very simple interview plan with a location scout image, um, us getting in place, questions, and then the final picture in the bottom right. Because VR is such a new world for the majority of the film's audience, it was really important to me to use a lot of classic documentary techniques to help people relate to the space um, who've not tried VR before. And one key to that was shooting very simple talking head interviews, which are very common in expositional documentaries. I found that really helped ground the context for some of the stories and also helped us focus on the voices of the subjects. I took the freedom to also take reference photography for all of the setup interviews. This is a still from Jenny's introductory talking head interview and my reference taken whilst I was location scouting. And I took reference footage for almost every scene I choreographed with a big chunk, which was a big chunk of my time during production, just the same as it was in virtually speaking, but it was very much worth it. One of the other long distance couples, Dragonheart and Is Your Boy, um, who are both staff at the exotic club, Club Zodiac, Instead of relying upon a talking head situation for their introductory scene, I decided to give them the freedom to share their story over a VR game of pool. And the mix of their real voice and their body language over the interaction with the pool table presents a much more interesting conversation that I found mixes these two truths, fantasy truth and authentic truth. I think Whenever we're interviewed, we are aware of the camera and 
most of the time unconsciously presenting a version of ourselves that is slightly skewed from ourselves when there's no camera present. And in VR, that camera version of ourselves is exaggerated so much that it's an entirely other character existing in a, in a world. And so that line of truth is much more real. And I'm, I used cinematography to further exaggerate that fantastical truth as a tangible, real place. And on a sound note, all of the voices are recorded through the subject's own headset microphones, which often sound bad, but it really helped bring us into their authentic truth and their authentic world. A scene that illustrates this idea the most is in a dance sequence with Dust Bunny and Toaster. We choreographed a dance together inspired by the first time that they met in real life. And in the film, they first tell that story through a talking head interview, and then their dialogue drops away into an uplifting dance montage. And in this dance, the question of their physical identities drops away and they're just dust bunny and toaster. And to me, this was probably the most verite aspect to the production, where the truth of the film is most distinct and we are just embracing the joy of their on-screen personas. This collaborative dancing was also a method used in Alma Harrell's documentaries in Bombay Beach. The editing process began as soon as I started filming. I edited scenes over the year long production as I was going, crafting the narrative arc of each subject, subject guided by emotion and instinct. Um, so, the time for, so by the time I got to editing the final picture and the picture lock of the film, um, it was already finding its feet and the film really found itself. I think my biggest reflection about the making of We Met in Virtual Reality is through, oh, I think that's my biggest reflection, sorry, about the making of We Met in Virtual Reality is leaning into play and through carefully selected locations, giving subjects freedom, immersing myself into different communities and being aware of all the different layers of truth, I think is the recipe to how I achieve the film. A lot of the time I would be filming an event or an interview and I had no idea what that moment would be in the final edit. And I think it's those scenes that a lot of the time are the most precious. I made this film entirely by myself with just a burning passion to represent the people and the world that I love. And I want to encourage everyone to follow your own curiosities and not overly consider what the outcome may be, but know that it just will be beautiful. That's all I have for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to make a very quick transition into VR now, and I'm going to load up my VR camera and give you a demo. And you'll be able to hear me as well, um, but bear with me for a few minutes. But thank you so much for listening to that. Okay, you should be able to hear me um, over on my other Zoom, which is also named Joe Hunting. Um, would you like me to stop sharing my screen on my presentation? Yes, please. Would that be helpful? Okay, I should have done that. All right, there we go. Wonderful. So that is actually not me. That is a cat. Um, I look like this. Hello, everyone. So this is how most people know me and behind me over here is the wonderful Jenny who is a subject of we met in virtual reality did you did you I don't know if you planned to, to stand there I that was just perfect um and what I'd like to do is just show you the VRC lens camera which I just discussed in the presentation at the moment I am just using the native VR chat camera um, which I will also show you in this demo. So I'm going to switch over to my perspective so you can see what I'm seeing. And if it's not clear, we are in VR chat right now, which is the social VR platform. Okay, here is the native VR chat camera, which was released, I think, in winter of last year or the fall of last year. Um, here is Jenny standing with us as well. And with this camera, um, you can do very simple simulated depth of field. So anyone can come into VR chat and use these techniques and shoot photography and make a film with really accessible, easy to use functions. 
you can see if I'm holding the camera here, I'm going to add a stabilizer so it's a little bit softer. If we go to behavior, smooth. On this right wing here, I can zoom in and out. And add a simulated depth of field here with the focus options. And this is native to VRChat, as I mentioned. So if you wanted to try this, you can jump into VRChat and give this a go. I'm going to change to my camera there so you can get a much better look at Jenny here. <laughs> so this is on autofocus. If I wanted to bring it into manual focus, that's possible as well. Here, come, come forward, Jenny. Get real blurry. There you go. And you can see, compared to when VR chat was first released um, and the images that we were seeing, this is a much more real and grounded way of, of seeing a virtual world. Well, too close. <laughs> awesome. Now, I know probably a lot of people watching may be already aware of this camera. So I'm going to move on to showing the VRC lens camera, which is the camera that I was discussing in my lecture and was also the camera that I shot We Met in Virtual Reality on. And this camera is a community-made go look uh, camera. So in order to use it, it is one that you have to upload on your avatar and upload your avatar into VR chat. So it does require a little bit of um, knowledge in order to understand with Unity, um, but I highly recommend trying it if you're interested in a more cinematic approach with filming. Now, I'm gonna to change to my perspective again. Let's open the camera here. Here we are. This is the camera in my hands and you'll see if I open, well, hopefully, fingers crossed. Jenny, cross your fingers. Okay, I think VR chat has updated recently. And so typically this VRC lens camera would override the VR chat camera. And I would be seeing what is meant to be seen. I would, I would see my output here in the VR chat camera, but forgive me, I haven't been in VR for a good amount of time as I've been touring and traveling, promoting the film, but I would like everyone to focus intently on this, you can see other, um, comparatively speaking to the native VR chat camera, I can now see I've got auto exposure on, I'm on F 2.8 aperture, I'm on the 24 millimeter lens, depth of field is on, and I also have an image stabilizer as well. And by opening my menu, I can open up a zoom, zoom in and out. You can see my focal length is also changing there. I can bring it in on a 35 if I wanted to, oh, well, I may as well stay on a 50. Um, and then I can even go, well, one moment. Again, I have not been in VR for too long. It's funny, I haven't, I'm, I'm a professional, I promise. Let's turn off flick select, that's nasty business. Um, I'm on a 50 mil now by accident, but we're gonna keep it that way. And here you can see, if I go into my focus menu, I can use manual focus. And this camera is so fantastic. You can even see focus peaking, which is focus assist. So if you see those red lines appearing on my camera monitor here, there we are. That is what is in focus, just like a live action camera. And uh, when it comes to shooting, we met in virtual reality, I would often meet Jenny, for example. We would find a world to film in. I would set up a camera and ensure it was in focus and then you'd either shoot handheld or sometimes drop it down. So it was still. And then I've left my camera in place just using the drone features in the menu. Now I'm not going to go through everything as seen in the menu here, as I think that would be quite overwhelming. Um, but I hope this gives you a brief introduction to what filmmaking in VR is like. Um, oh, one thing before we move into questions, in the drone menu, I can also fly the camera 
as a drone and even control the pitch and the pivot with my wrist and then fly it move around and often when it comes to dance sequences and tracking shots and very choreographed scenes flying the drone in this way was often a lot easier than any other method it was a method i used frequently alongside shooting handheld as i'm doing now now i'm going to change back to my vr chat camera pr perspective now so i'm going to move back into this one and then i'm happy to open for questions unless you would like to see more shenanigans <laughs> which i'm also happy to see but thank you very much for listening i hope this was insightful and inspiring thank you so much joe and jenny <laughs> i don't know if we can hear jenny but uh, thank you so much i'm going to invite the panelists from the open documentary lab to come on screen with us Okay, yeah, sounds great. Unfortunately, I don't think we can hear Jenny. No. Um, no. All right. No. <laughs> so we have um, a wonderful group of people from, from our lab um, and uh, lots of questions for you. We'll start with uh, Sarah. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's fascinating, you know, it's just a whole new world of, of filmmaking um, uh, and beautiful too and, and great topic. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the editing process? So, mm. you know, you showed how you videotaped and I know you said that you edited as you went, but how did that work? And, you know, what mm. did you have at the end when, and did you have an editing process after you shot it at all? Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, um... You know, when, when, whenever I would find a moment or find someone that was in a story and I felt could communicate that story, um, I, you know, I'd have several conversations with them and explain what the film was and was very open about the making of the documentary and the values of what it was. And, and um, everyone was very appreciative and understanding and kind of willing to, to jump on board. Um, I would edit conversations down. And as I was doing that, kind of piece together the story of, of their arc. And after finding all of the subjects of the film, I kind of weaved them in together. When it came to the picture lock and the editing process more strictly, where I, I stopped filming, it's hard to define the moment of when I stopped filming. Uh, I think every documentary filmmaker would probably say the same thing. The film was like, it feels like you never stop. Um, but I really slowed down in, in August of 2021 um, and just discovered moments that spoke so much truth in what VR was to people in the pandemic and how it was forging new relationships and over helping people overcome really difficult situations. I think there was, like I can name several moments that informed the whole edit of the film um so it's difficult for me to really break down the edit i think it was a very playful process in constantly asking myself what moments are speak that fantasy truth and the authentic truth in the best way possible um and also trying to position the documentary and use techniques and the form that i've studied in person and, and seen in live action to sit alongside documentaries that are in live action as well. Um, so kind of the, the approach and the mindset was just, I was editing a documentary as I would if it was in real life. Yusuf. Joe, thank you so much for, for this marvelous presentation. I have many, 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 many questions that I'm going to reduce to three questions. Um, the, the first question is, I'm, uh, I saw that you have one of these machines. It's an Atari 2600 and several um, CRT retrofitted um, screens. Oh, oh right. Background. 
Oh I, yes. I want, learn, I want to learn more about uh, how, why. I'm 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 really a, a big fan of obsolete technologies. So I. <laughs> why oh, great I'm, question. Yes. Yeah, where on earth are we? I should have introduced that. Absolutely, we are in a world created by a very talented and a friend of mine named Fins. Um, I hope some people watching may know Fins. Um, and this world is kind of cyberpunk retro um, world that I just love so much. I think it has an awesome style. So it's not my own creation. This is absolutely um, all the credit goes to Fins. But I agree, I think aesthetic reasons, um, I'm afraid there is no function to this technology. <laughs> Apart from cats, you know, that's important. Now, my uh, thank you for for uh, sharing that. Uh, my my last two questions are first, do you consider that you live uh, two parallel lives when when you are in, in like your regular physical life and your mm -hmm. digital uh, life with your avatar? Do, do you consider that like you are living in two dimensions in a way? And the last question um, is how I, I've been experiencing, uh, like I've been playing Roblox for, for quite a while, and I found that it affects my dreams. Mm, uh, oh. I, mm -hmm. I want to learn about your experience dreaming uh, after like playing several hours or being in that place for several hours. Thank you. Right. Oh, yes, I love that second question. To answer the, the first question about how living separate lives and the distinguishment between those two. I think in my short filmmaking and even the lead up to making We Met in Virtual Reality, my real life was more separate as I was in film school. So I was making live action documentaries and I was actually specialized in sound design um, whilst I was at film school. And so I kind of lived another life, I feel, whilst I was studying and making these VR documentaries in my own time and in my own personal hours. And often, you know, that would feel like a bubble, but to just speak very personally now with, the, you know, very grateful for the success that we met in virtual re reality has had, that line between my two lives is, is certainly blurred now. And it's, it's I think VR is just a, a whole part of me. And um, I think it will stay that way for for a long time as i'm working on new projects so i think in the beginning it certainly did um but everyone knows me as joe my name in vr is, is poe um but most people know me as joe now and so it really feels like my real identity is is one that is just moved into to here as well and i'm comfortable with that you know there are many vr chat users who really that separation is is vital to the platform the experience of the platform and you know coming here and being a different version or expressing yourself in a different way is is a motivation to use it and so you know my experience is is just one and many people benefit and have their own experiences but just answer the question that would be mine and in terms of dreams i dream of my friends in avatars all of the time sometimes i have a dream where i'm in my kitchen my real life physical world kitchen and then Jenny walks in with her pink hair saying, oh, hey, Poe, how's it going? And it's completely natural um, because my brain just knows that personality as their avatar and it's completely accepted um, because I'm so used to being in this space. Um, I dream of worlds and avatars and my friends constantly, just as the same as your brain would influence and create dreams that you'd form from people in the physical world. So I think that's a fascinating question. And I think it comes with spending a lot of time in VR as well. And I think if I was to answer that question in 2018, when I was first starting, I probably wouldn't have feel the same way, but um, with VR being such a core component of my social and career, it, yeah. I'm not surprised that that's happening. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's amazing. Thank you so much. I remember dreaming of Pac-Man, Yusuf, speaking of old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, thank you. That was a great dream question. Uh, Craig. 
Uh, hi, Joe. Wonderful work. Congratulations. And thanks for presenting it here today. And uh, thank you, Jenny, as well. Uh, so uh, VR chat is not open source, open source as such, but it is, a, it, it is a platform that's of and by the community. Can you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about the corporate colonization of the, the virtual experience you know, Zuckerberg's metaverse and Snapchat and AR and so forth. What do we stand mm. to lose by that colonization? Mm. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, that's an excellent question. Certainly a, one for the future. I think uh, to speak about the metaverse, um, I always feel and believe that what Zuckerberg and Meta will be um, with their own social VR platform horizons, it will be the Facebook of VR, just as the way, just the way that Facebook is the Facebook of the Facebook on the internet. I think it will serve as a wonderful place for people who are just jumping in for a session, um, maybe, you know, once a month, once every two months, just very casually to see family and friends and, and to have meetings. I think it will be a good accessible space for that, but I don't think it's going to infringe and change the space that I'm in right now. I think the people who want to build their own avatars and want to build their own worlds and express themselves freely will always have a passion for that. And VR chat won't stop existing and other creative platforms like this won't, won't stop existing because of, I think there's a need to express yourself in VR and obviously meta, you can express yourself and change the way you look, but giving the users a freedom to create their identity entirely from scratch I think is invaluable and will always stay. So I'm not worried about the corporate future. I'm genuinely try to see it in an optimistic way in understanding that more, it's, more people are going to come in. It's going to become more popular and the communities and the existing worlds will only grow. One thing that is my only concern to answer the question is to protect and remember the communities and the people that pioneered the space that we're in now. And I hope that We Met in Virtual Reality does that. I think an issue with the beginnings of the internet and those who pioneered the internet, many of them are LGBT and they come from marginalized communities. And sometimes we forget that history when we're looking at the internet today. And that's the same with VR technology and social VR. So when corporate um, corporations are coming in and, and, and claiming ownership, it's important to me that we recognize the communities that pioneered it. Thank you. I'm going to jump in with a question because it's relevant um, from an anonymous person, Info. Um, but the question is around intellectual property issues that come from um, recording in these worlds uh, and that are co-created by other people. So uh, mm. a bit about um, ownership and uh, co-creation as you're working with these creators of avatars and assets and worlds. Absolutely. Yes. Um... Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question that I get asked often. I think, firstly, to speak from just a, a place of documentary um, at first, whenever I'm working with subjects and, and people, I'm always extremely open about the making of the documentary and what it stands for. And um, we do sign release forms for the documentary as well. And when it comes to worlds and well, I'll speak to worlds because worlds and avatars are two separate stories. When it comes to worlds, I generally try and contact the world creator of that scene world and explain the documentary to them with the, what the scene means and explain the context of that moment um, and include their world in the credits of the documentary. And you know, most of the time, the world creators are more than happy to see their creation used in a film as long as it's credited in the right way. Avatars are more of an interesting discussion as many of them are made from lots of different parts. And so it can be difficult to define that original creator. And so when I'm finding people to film with and communities, I'm always very careful about how they've been constructed and just understand where that identity, where that body has come from. Um, but also as it's a documentary, you do have ground to stand on um, when it comes to existing characters and assets that have been taken from various different places as it can fall under fair use, um, as it wasn't your intention to represent that character or represent that world or represent that person or existing character 
inner fiction or in a fictionalized purpose. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of moving parts, but being mindful and approaching a documentary in this space or a fiction or any film production with the same approach and the same understandings and learnings as we do in real life, I think it's just the best way to approach it. Thank you, Mathieu. Hey, thanks, Joe, for this uh, talk. It's really brilliant and so, so inspiring. Um, it was very interesting to hear you um, mention your method about all oh, location scouting and comparing this approach to uh, live, uh, live action. How would you, what would you say about um, animated film? Because in the end, there are some components of animation, like the emotions of the, the faces, the, the whole rendering. What, what would you say about this? Mm. I, I, I think it's amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, if you were to, if I was to answer the question of whether an animated film would be possible as a fiction, I think it's an absolute yes. Um, just as we use mocap studios for live recording, I think the way that social VR is advancing and um, VR chat specifically has added only recently a lot more um, live capturing features where you can wear more tracking and influence your actual faces movements in the world. Those new tools that have only become recently available to me are so much inspiration in creating characters and creating a documentary or a fiction in social VR entirely where all of the cast are from, you know, entirely around the world. I think it's, it's, it's a good insight to see this world, not just in VR chat, but a social VR platform in general as a studio space for creating an animated film um, where everyone can do it from their own homes and other, and other spaces and they don't have to be tied down to coming into a mocap studio. And I think that's a very exciting position to be in from a point of cinema. And I feel like we're on the forefront of a new point of cinema um, in documentary and in fiction. Um, naturally, my avatar has some movements. I can move my eyebrows. I can smile. And I can wink. Jenny can do the same thing. Um, and these animations are pre-rendered in my avatar. So I can, they're actually on my hand. So if I do this, it winks, whoops. And if I do a thumbs up, I do a little smile as well. And you can see with Jenny as well. Um, I think, you know, that form of animation, puppeteering, as I say, um, it's quite primitive, but as it's advancing, I think, you know, using facial animations to tell a story is, is, like, is doable and accessible. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of sign language and, and signs to activate your face, how did that work with the sign language group? How do you sign while mm. also operating yourself and your features? Well, I think the easiest way to answer that question is you can turn these animations off. And so I think when it comes to helping hands and, and Jenny, your sign language, you turn your gestures off. And oh, she's saying there, clearly I'm wrong. <laughs> um, or you keep them on and then your face just moves and you just let it happen yeah is that right okay yeah I think everyone's quite understanding in this space when you're talking to someone and they're doing this and their face is moving like wild because everyone understands the context and why that's happening um, but for some people I know they turn those animations off and others just let their face run wild <laughs> thank you Jenny uh, Natasha. Hi, Joe. Very, very, very interesting work. Thank you very much uh, for sharing all this information. I, I have uh, thousands of questions, but <laughs> until you stop me, I will keep asking. So uh, first, I wanted to go back to the permissions and ask you, did you ask release forms from the real protagonists? How, how that, does this work? Yes. Yeah, it's um, it's a kind of new, you know, it's a new territory when when coming to release forms, you're asking yeah. someone to reveal their real identity in order to be a part of a film where their identity is completely hidden. Um, so there's a lot of trust involved 
and I spent a lot of time speaking with Jenny and all of the subjects of the film of what it was and what it meant and I think it was important to me to be very close with everyone appearing in the film and I'm you know very grateful to say that all of the subjects of the film are like my best friends now and the film would not exist without them it was complete collaboration um, and I wouldn't have been able to have edited the film or got it to Sundance had it not been for the support of everyone around the film. Um, and so, you know, just kind of gaining trust and talking through what the film was, I think was just the most vital thing in giving them the belief and the understanding that they can sign this release and their real identities will not be revealed unless, you know, they want them to be and they have consent. So. I'm very careful around um, the subjects of the film. Um, but yes, we do all sign release forms. Hey, can, may I, sorry, may I ask you if you have met your protagonists in real life? <laughs> um, yes, Jenny is actually in the other room. Uh, we met for the first time at Sundance. We went to Park City anyway, even though Sundance was all online this year. Um, because we were so excited to meet in person for the first time after knowing each other for about a year and a half. And then we were fortunate to meet Dust Bunny at True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri, where we also met friends from the Helping Hands community. Um, and we're actually going to Calgary Film Festival, Calgary Underground Film Festival in a week's time to meet um, four other subjects of the film. So the film tour and us being able to share the film at festivals is not only special because we get to screen the film and celebrate the documentary with you know incredible audiences but also it's an opportunity for all of us to meet in person which is so much fun um and so lovely and wonderful so yes and uh, we, we continue to do so and the last question and uh, then somebody else can have you there for answering so uh, may i ask you about how how did you experience this bodiless let's say experience of filming of being there and working very hard actually at the same time it's not that you're just a participant in the vr chat right you're also working very hard as a filmmaker so mm. how is this body how does your body feel when it's only mentally that you are there i don't know if i can express it very well oh, okay right yeah no one's ever asked me this question before um i think if you were to compare this sort of production with a real production. Um, it, you know, I have it easy. I essentially made the film in my pajamas. <laughs> and so I cannot complain, I feel. I was based in the UK whilst making the, We Met in Virtual Reality and all of the subjects of the film are all based in the US. And so my filming times were typically between 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. And so I was a nocturnal creature and I would often wake up in the night. Yeah, Jenny's, you know, bearing head or head in her hands. Um, so it was physically demanding in the way of how it strained on my sleep. Um, sleeping was by far the most difficult aspect of the production um, and I intend not to do it again. But I mean, aside from that, it was not much physical movement and I was able to um, use the camera and exploit its tools in a way that I didn't have to move around my play space too much physically. It was only very minute movements, um, and very subtle when shooting handheld. Um, and in terms of wearing many hats, when it comes to filmmaking in general, I just, I think I've always been an independent filmmaker. Um, as I mentioned in my discussions, I've been very used to making films on my own and editing, shooting, writing and directing in, and, and in control of all moving parts. You know, I was, was very used to that, but I think it was certainly a challenge when it came to delivery for Sundance and the post-production and the lead up to, to the festival premiere. That was a real tough situation for me. And as I mentioned earlier, had it not been for the subjects, they came in, they swooped underneath me and supported me and, and took some of the work and um, motivated me to edit and, and kind of push this baby out, if you will. You know, I think that was what saved my mental and physical health when it came to getting the film out um, and is also reflective of what the film is about too, about community and friendships and relationships online as well. So there's a lot of love in, in wrapped up in the documentary. Um, so it was, it was straining, but I consider myself lucky to be making a film in my pajamas most of the time. So I think um, I have not much to complain about. I'd feel wrong to complain.
Nim. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for this beautiful film. And uh, specifically, I have to give a shout out to the lanterns uh, scene, which is just so beautiful. And uh, no spoilers here, but really, really an amazing scene that's pure cinema. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions. One is about the production, but I'll actually start with um, several studies that talk about how um, Gen Zs feel more like themselves in character and the fact that you're right now talking to us as an avatar and not going back to Zoom. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that choice. Oh, yeah, okay. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you for referencing that scene. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, there were scenes that really influenced the edit of the film and that was absolutely one. Um, I feel very grateful to have worked with Ray um, and his family in that moment. But to answer the question about uh, why I'm deciding to be this version of myself right now, I think it's the version that is reflective of the film um, and also the work that I make and the, the content that I will continue to create. And so it just feels like this is a better insight into myself as a creative individual. And so that's why I decided to, to stay in this form uh, of me. Um, it's also nice to not have to look at a video call um, and instead get to be immersed in a 3D environment. It's a lot easier to talk on a MIT lecture when you're not staring at the audience. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And uh, the second question I wanted to ask you is, so you're filming, you're capturing footage. How much uh, time have you spent with every character? How much footage, footage is on the editing floor? Um, did you talk to the protagonist during the editing? How many takes mm. of several scenes going back and forth? Um, this mm. process is really fascinating uh, for me. Thank you. Sure. I didn't, it was very rare that we reshot anything for the documentary. Everything that you see, most things that you see in the film are all captured once because um, I was very excited to, to capture an authentic moment. Um, and that was important to me. I think in terms of being an interview in a moment, you know, for example, there's moments where we're having an interview and we're, we're sharing a conversation and then um, a housemate in the background sneezes and you can hear it through their microphone. And then I will then come in and say, let's take that again. Um, I feel like that those are the only situations where I was very forceful on wanting to, to redo takes. Um, the most, the, the piece of the production that I stepped in the most as a, as a director and, and cinematographer was in the cutaways and creating space in all of the worlds. Because in many situations, I go into a situation and I react to it and capture the moment. But shaping that, into a space and giving audiences spatial awareness, I think is really important when you're in a VR space and uh, more so than in real life. And so I would often go to worlds after shooting a scene or after shooting an interview or sometimes prior if I know where I'm filming and I would film cutaways of, of trees or of the subjects walking down a hill into where we had our interview and helping to construct a, a space around their discussion or just around a moment. In, in general. But I think when it comes to the observational moments in the film where it's very clear that, or I hope it's clear that it's not constructed, um, it's just a reaction to the moment. Those were all um, live and they, they didn't have any influence and in, in retakes. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you very much. Joe, you talk a, a, quite a bit about mental health and the COVID crisis and pandemic period. And I'm curious to have some more insight into your relationship to people that are so far away and how to make sure that that care is there. And I know mm. you've spoken about the community um, and collaboration, uh, but as a filmmaker, what are the kind of heightened, um, mm. heightened uh, concerns in terms of ethics to the people mm. that you're filming? Yeah, I think that's a really valuable question. Um, I want to think about this before answering it. I think it's very instinctual and just being a fully present listener in, in the moment and understanding that maybe, maybe focus on, I think I always try to focus my mind on the person behind the avatar sometimes when it came to 
richer conversations about their personal life and struggles with mental health or another anecdote that comes from um, you know personal details I think just having an, a, a very clear and obvious awareness that that might influence how they're represented and maybe not be completely truthful as well because if we're in VR and we're in a space and it's harder to read people um, I think it's just being a fully present listener but I think there were concerns with me and taking advantage of subjects and of stories and capturing a moment where they're not, you know, fully representing themselves perhaps in the most honest way. And they're, they're leaning into to a version of themselves that maybe isn't truthful. And so I think discussing, you know, meeting the subjects and talking to them and, and just telling them about the film and talking about the context where it's going to be released. And, um, you know, I want to share this story not to, you know, not from a place of judgment, from, but from a place of intelligence and a place of mutual respect and wanting to share a story that other people can relate to, but just in another reality, um, I think would be, you know, my approach to that and still is my approach to that. I think just listening is, is extremely key when, when dealing with those more delicate subjects, perhaps more so than you would when you're interviewing someone in person. Raysom from uh, the chat asks, uh, do you have any response to people who see the metaverse as just a tool of escapism to this question of, you know, performance, mm. even if people are able to cultivate community online via social apps? I think, I think escapism is, is one of the joys of VR and it will continue to be. It's one of the joys of my own experience of VR. I, I think I certainly there's a reason I come into this space to escape. Um, and I think many people do. I think that's an extremely valid reason to come into the space. And I don't think it should be any different in, in the future as well. I think many of us always need escape. And VR is one of, you know, a few perfect havens to completely escape. I think if there's a concern in that question, balance is naturally very key and important as it is with any social media online making sure that you're not fully leaning in to this space and, and into VR and maybe another version or, you know, this escapist reality and ensuring that you're not isolating, you know, that part of yourself in real life. But I think you could say that to anything on the internet. So balance is, is key, but I think escapism is a joy of VR. Um, absolutely. Um, is there, this is a question from Merit, uh, is there any way to interface with any live action footage, like laying live action on top hmm. of VR escapes? Also, how is the audio in terms of positionality or directionality? Is it 3D? Mm. Oh, that, yeah, great questions. To answer the, the first question about weaving in live action footage into a, I mean, in my context, I'll speak from myself, uh, a documentary. I did that in my two short films, A Wider Screen and, uh, sorry, Club Zodiac. And when touring those films and presenting them at festivals, I would often ask people, what was your favorite scene? And what did you connect to? And what was a moment that, you know, sparked interest for you to get some, some feedback? And I would say 90% of the time, the audiences would always say, oh, I loved it when I got to see the person behind the avatar in real life that completely changed the way that I see them. Um, and it was so dramatic and, and interesting. And that actually frustrated me uh, creatively. And I realized it in that moment. I, that's not what I intended. And so it was a very, um, very obvious decision for me from the get-go with We Met in Virtual Reality to never use or not use any physical live action footage to represent the way that I see the people in VR um, the way that I see them and their truths here. I think leaving the real context and the physical world of that person up to the imagination is far more interesting and compelling than to, to show it, um, you know, obviously just in a live action piece of footage. But saying that, it can also be a really great tool for dramatic effect. So it depends on the context. It depends on what the form and the purpose of the project is. But for my own interest, I find that much more compelling. Um, but it can be very dramatic, as I've learned. Um, and there was a second question about audio. 
Um, the way that I recorded the audio in for We Met in Virtual Reality in all of my films, my head is the microphone. And so if I'm staring at you right now and you're talking to me, then I am receiving your dialogue in stereo. So it's going into both of my ears. But if I turn my head like this, then I'm receiving your audio into my right ear. And then I might have to pull that in to a sound software, convert it to mono, so it's in both ears and then to stereo, if I'm only capturing in one ear. So I was very careful in not positioning myself at any diagonal points, because then you're not getting a clean feed in either ear and it can sometimes sound a little bit off-putting. So whenever I'm shooting a project, I am always staring the subjects right in the eye. And I think that's actually, you know, typically a, a good tool. Or sometimes I'm capturing a live event and I'm very um, distinct that my it is only coming into one ear and then I can convert that and it's very easy to play with when I come into post-production. Craig. Yeah, hi, thank, thanks, Joe. Uh, just just uh, another quick question. Suppose that the technology goes away tomorrow, you know, the solar flare takes out the internet, you know, virtual reality will never be again somehow. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit about how you might imagine that identity formation in the real world ha will have a la lasting change based on um, this virtual experience that you um, inhabit? Oh gosh, okay, an apocalypse question. Um... That's that's a that's a, a tough one. I think so that I would to just rephrase the question for my own understanding, what is that asking if the technology went away tomorrow, how would my own experience of my own persona affect the way that I live my life now if, if I if I could never use it again? Well, yes, you and everybody else. Like I think that there's mm. been a fundamental change in the way that people uh, imagine themselves and their uh, relationships and the world around them. Uh, that has grown out of these experiences just generally. And I think that something will stick around in the real world, mm. even if the technology doesn't. So I don't know if you've considered that. Oh, gosh. Well, I guess it is uh, a kind of frightening question that some people might lose a part of themselves that they really needed. And it was a crutch, you know, during that moment. You know, I like to imagine, I think the healthiest way to use VR is, is balanced and to, you know, form different parts of your being and, and learn and learn about new cultures, forge new relationships and reflect upon those in, in the physical world. But if it was to take, if it was taken away in a moment where you're in that and you're embodying that world and maybe your physical world or your real life context is much more limiting, it can feel like all of a sudden, you know, there's a whole world that's been taken away from you. And that could be a social issue, um, but it's, it's hard to, imagine i think if i was to just talk from a personal perspective um you know if that was to happen i would lose um a community and a whole collection of people that are so close to my family um and i would lose a way to communicate with them that wasn't in a immersive 3d world and that would be deeply upsetting of course um but i'd like to imagine that there you know there are ways to overcome that of course we'd go back to what we were before, um, but I won't forget anything that happened in in this world. It's it's affected the way that I interact with people and and meet people and engage with different communities and reflect upon the world in in a much more open minded and distinct way. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a ramble on that question. It's a very difficult one to answer, to be honest, um, but also a very good one to ask in terms of the philosophy and and what this technology is for people who really need it um as it's a crutch for many thank you sarah i have a two-part question um one you know with this new vr lens camera are you seeing a lot of people starting to use it and do you know tell stories uh, in the uh, metaverse? And who are they? And is there a community around storytellers? You know who are who are doing these types of stories? And then my second question is: You had said, I think, in your immerse article that most that you've seen up to this point are told from the outside. They're not going in. And so, 
how would you, what would you say to people, journalists, for instance, who maybe want to start telling mm. stories in there? How do, how do they go about this? Mm. Yeah, certainly. To speak to the first point, um, there are other filmmakers using VRC lens and it's, it's a really exciting time, I think, for users who are coming in and trying the camera out. I'm really encouraging and um, host workshops for the camera sometimes and I'm really excited about others using the camera and making films. There is, I know, one huge fiction production in um, post, I think, at the moment um, called Into the Metaverse, which is created by um, a film studio who, or whose intention are to make really big blockbuster um, like films and series content. And then there is other documentary filmmakers coming in and using this camera to document the club scenes, the music scenes, um, the music community that exists here. Um, there was a recent film uh, that released on PBS that is a really well-made documentary, which I believe used this camera or certainly the depth of field applications that's on the VRChat camera. And it's a very well-made um, documentary. So certainly other people are using it. And I think documenting this space as much as we can is, is really exciting. And um, really progressive and so it's an exciting time if I was to advise on how to approach that if you know in a quick window if you don't have much time I just think the most valuable thing in coming into social VR is to understand that many of the communities excuse me have their own you know their own worlds and their own people and their own culture and making sure you research and immerse yourself and, and speak to those who are leading the community and those who are just on the outskirts of it. And the story that you're trying to tell, I think researching it is, is vital instead of, as I mentioned in the article, kind of looking at it from a place of being on the outside. I think being on the inside is, is vital um, because it is such a different well, it's a whole other world. You know, I think it's, it's like flying a helicopter over a town and, and filming it from the top and talking about it instead of going down and actually talking to the people and understanding what it means and then going back into the helicopter and maybe making the same film, but with an understanding of what the people are and what they value. Um, I think that would be vital. And actually logistically doing that is a little tricky sometimes because getting into the communities can be confusing um, because VR chat specifically doesn't have its own social community system to navigate via the menu. It's, it's all scattered on Discord servers, on Twitter, in different places. Um, and so it can be quite overwhelming at first and you have to know the right people. But I think we're getting to a place where there's a lot of ambassadors and a lot of people who are helping journalists come into the space and, and find the stories that they're interested in telling. Thank you, Joe. We have time for one last quick question. Uh, Nim? Um, I wanted to ask about the different audiences. So people who, who were in a social VR platform versus people who haven't had a chance to put a VR headset. Um, like, do you see a difference in how they see the movie? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I, I love the difference. When I was editing, we met in virtual reality. It was really important to me to understand those both audiences and to find a bridge um, that would, would connect them both. So people in VR can see and find things that maybe would make them laugh and, you know, someone's tracking breaks and, and it's a whole nightmare. I think audiences in VR can, can find a lot of humor and, and relatability to the documentary and as well as the, the ways that VR has helped people overcome situations. Um, you know, I hope VR audiences will be able to empathize and relate to those. Whereas people outside of VR, the documentary is positioned in a way that they can come in and learn about the value of this space from really insightful, wonderful voices who um, I think anyone can relate to in and outside of VR. And so I think there's a balance between both worlds that was really key to the success of the film. Um, and you know, I'm grateful that whenever we go to a screening and we are watching the film with a collection of people who've never tried VR, um, a lot of the time they walk away from the film just with a realization in the most fundamental and simple way that there's a whole other reality that exists and they could jump in it and try it 
and maybe they want to give it a go as well, which is very exciting to me. Um, and they're inspired by the people in VR. Um, I think that is the most influential thing you can say to me because um, VR can have a stigma, as does every online community and every gaming community of potentially being quite isolating and quite negative. So when people walk away from the film inspired by the people of VR and and wanting to grow their own relationships online, it's 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 really motivating. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it was very important to me to balance those those two worlds, and I love it whenever we get to see the film with a completely fresh audience. And some people walk away and think that was not for me. I have no idea what I just watched. That was a complete mess. Um, that's equally valuable uh, <laughs> in recognizing maybe what uh, what issues the film has. It's by no no means perfect. And speaking of screenings, uh, Joe, where where might our audiences today or people watching this be able to see the film? Well, we um, the best way to follow our announcements and our screenings is to follow at We Met in VR Film on Twitter. You can also find me at Joe A Hunting on Twitter, and we're posting all of our festival screenings there. The last announcements we had was um, Sydney Film Festival and full frame that unfortunately has just passed past. Um, we have a screening coming up, which, oh, in Calgary, I can say Calgary, Canada, if anyone's over in Western Canada. And then we might have one more after that, which might be a little bit easier for uh, audiences to, to attend, but I can't say it just yet, I'm afraid. So we'll, we'll um, very here. soon we'll be <laughs> announcing on the Twitter profiles. Wonderful, well, we will stay uh, tuned to that. Uh potentially big announcement. And um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thanks to you, Joe, for coming to us from London and from VR Chat. And thanks to all our attendees and our funders, MacArthur, Ford Foundation, as well as IDFA Doc, Doc Lab. And uh, we'll see you next week at the public uh, talk series with a talk by Sister Sylvester. See you then, all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you.